Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Hometown Heroes, I'm Mike Kenichi. And if you've followed high school football over the years, there have been many great people who have impacted the game. And if you followed the Valley, you saw many great coaches such as Billy McAllister, Jack Hunt, Charlie DeCenzo, Lou DiFilippo, Bob Riggio, just to name a few. But in 1962, there was a man who entered Derby and built a program that would go on to have a winning tradition. And we are honored to have him today, the legendary coach, Ron Carbone. And coach, I wanna thank you for coming on today. It's really an honor. Thank you, Mike, it's my, my pleasure. Now coach, let me ask you, um, <coughs> When did a love for football begin for you? I mean, were you a little kid? Did you enjoy football? I mean, did you follow any college or pro teams as a kid? Yeah, when I was a kid, Mike, um, we played uh, football during the fall. We played basketball during the winter, and we played baseball right. in the spring. Right. And those are the only three sports that we played in my neighborhood, in Fairhaven. Right. Okay. And uh, it was a uh, situation where we had uh, on my street, on uh, Main Main Street, we had the New New Haven Blues Boys Club, right? Which was a Sandlot team. In those days, there were a lot of Sandlot teams all over all over New Haven, right. and they they played football, basketball, and softball or baseball. And the younger kids in the area kind of looked up to the kid, the people, the young men that played with the Blues. Right. And everybody wanted to be. A b player for the Blues when they grew up, right. so that's how we—that's uh, how I got introduced to uh, to sports. Everybody on my street was uh, a rabbit sports fan. Uh, we had uh, Dodger fans and Yankee fans that would <laughs> right, and it was big back then, <laughs> the rivalry, and you had the Giants as well. So yeah, you had the three Giants, New yeah. York teams playing yeah. baseball. Yeah, so there was a lot of interest in sports, and uh, we had a lot of hometown heroes that we looked up to. Right. And they were all athletics, athletes. Right, so let me ask you this. There was obviously no Pop Warner, so no. basically you learned to play football by just being out there every day, yeah. playing Sandlot, this and that. Yeah. Um, I mean, how did, was it organized? Were there many teams or was it just a, how did they do it? Well, you had some neighborhood teams that right. would play each other once in a while, but most of the time, we just get everybody in our neighborhood and we go down to either Blake Field or Rice Field. And if it was football, we put tape around our, our pants right. and, and stuff them with, with leaves. Oh, wow. And we did the same thing for shoulder pads. <laughs> right. And that was it. And there were no helmets. No obviously. helmets, no. But uh, uh, we play, you know, tackle football right. under those circumstances. And how old were you, would you say, when you first started doing it? You know, I must have been um, 10, 11, 12 years old, or about, right. you know. And we had kids who were of all ages, but most of them were in that, um, you know, 10 to 15 age bracket. Right. I never played uh, regular organized football until my sophomore year at Wilbur Cross. Right. I, I went to school in a uh, system that uh, had junior high school, 7th, 8th, and ninth, right. and senior high school, 10, 11, and 12. So I was in the 10th grade before I ever played uh, organized, organized ball. ball. Matter of fact, most of us had to be taught how to put the, stuff, the equipment on and wow. all this other stuff, because we never had that before. Right, now let me ask you, as a kid, a young kid, did you go to a lot of Wilbur Cross games as a kid? I mean, were they, they were obviously a school then, correct? Yeah, they were a school at that particular time. And because they were in our neighbor, you know, we were in their district. Right. We used to follow the, the high school pretty closely. And uh, we had uh, Jerry Tarazzi, who was a, uh, an administrator in New Haven for a long, long time, was an older kid in our neighborhood. And he played for Cross. And he, he taught us the whole numbering system Right. And plays and all this other stuff that we would run in the street. Really? We had plays like uh, down and out behind the caddy, right. uh, button, hold, uh, button hook on the manhole cover, that type of stuff. And you had to wait, make sure the cards were not coming when you ran a play, otherwise you'd get somebody hurt. Right. So that's, that's the way it happened with me. Right, and I, I got to believe, Coach, that that's how you, you kids that age had to be tough in order to play these games all the time because, again, there were no pads and it wasn't touch football, it wasn't no. flag. You basically were tackling each other all the time. So I'm sure 
that's where you developed a lot of your toughness at a young uh, age, correct? I, I, I think that had a lot to do with it. I also think that when you play that way where uh, nobody is in charge of the game, you don't have an adult uh, breaking kids up into little groups and all that other stuff, right. a lot of leadership emerges from that type of a setting. Somebody has to take the take control. Right. Somebody has to say, okay, you're on this team, you're that type of stuff. Right. And that's what happened. And uh, I don't, you know, I don't see that too much today. Today, all of these teams are organized. They have all these beautiful equipment, jerseys and helmets and all this other stuff. But when I, when I started, there was none of that around. Right. I did play on the first Babe Ruth team in the city of New Haven. Right. I played on that team. Uh, I can't remember the year. It might have had to be in the 50s or, or late 40s. And uh, my team won the championship the very first year that we had the Babe Ruth League in New Haven. Really? That's why I remember that. <laughs> right. Yeah. So let me ask you, um, were the games played after school? Did you guys do them more on the weekend? I mean, were, were they generally right after school for the most part? We went after school, and on the weekend, <clears throat> we would pack a lunch and go up in the morning, right? probably to Rice Field, and play all day long, and at lunchtime stop and have our lunch, and then play a little bit more, wow. and then come on back home. Now, for me, that was a problem, because um, my family had a little restaurant next to the box shop. It was a coffee shop, coffee, donuts, sandwiches for lunch, and what have you. Right. And um, my four brothers and I were supposed to be working in the restaurant, and I, I, we all had our jobs. <clears throat> Mine was to bring the soda up in the cellar and fill up the... Right. Fill up the... Um, the soda machines and all this other stuff. And when I went up the park, I knew when I came home, my father was going to give me a shellacking because <laughs> I didn't do what I was supposed to do that particular <laughs> right. day. So I had, to, I had to pay a price for doing that. And I, I did, but my father was lenient. Right. But uh, Now, did your brothers play as well a lot of the games? I mean, you said you had four brothers. Yes. Right. My brother Tony played baseball at Notre Dame High School, and he's the only one that played besides me. Right. My other three brothers didn't play. Right, but did, did they play the Sandlot at all as kids? Or? You know, uh, I, I don't think they did. Right. Yeah. I think uh, Tony and my brother Tony and I played with the Sandlot kids, but right. uh, my other three brothers didn't do that. Right. Yeah. So let me ask you, you know, you talked about the Yankees and Dodgers a little bit. So you grew up right in the heart of that. That was a great time for baseball. Oh. Who was your team? Was it the Yankees? Was you know, it Mike, Dodgers? i tell you the truth. I didn't have a team. Right. I, I just loved everything. My brother Tony, on the other hand, was a Yankee fan. Right. And when the Yankees lost, he never ate supper that night. Really? He was so upset he would not eat supper. I had an Uncle Carmine who used to live upstairs from me. He was an usher at the bowl, the Yale Bowl. Right. Same thing. My Aunt Carrie would listen to the game on the radio. If Yale won, she'd cook. If Yale lost, she wouldn't cook. Really? And then wow. all the guys from the, from the club across the street there all knew that my Uncle Carmine got off the trolley on Lombard Street and walked down Main Street to go home. Right. And they'd all line up on the corner, and he'd be coming. Hey, Carmine, how'd Yale make out today? And he <laughs> so mad. I mean, this, this, is, this is what I was accustomed to. Right. You know? And um, if you were a Dodger fan and you're coming home from work and the Yankees won uh, and the, Dodger, the Dodgers got beat, you'd have to take a beating all the way to your house because yeah. they couldn't wait to get to you. Right. Now, you know, one of the things I... I wish I would have got to see, obviously I didn't, was Ebert's Field. Let me ask you, were you able to go there at all? Never went to Ebert's Field. No, huh? I went to the stadium with the PAL League, the Police Athletic League, once when I was a kid. Right. We got on a bus and we went to the stadium. But that's the only time. Right. Yeah. Now were you able to see Joe DiMaggio play in that game? No, no. I didn't see Joe DiMaggio. I saw him on TV. Right. I saw the other fellow Yogi on TV. and. Yeah. All the other great uh, Mantle and Maris and that crew, that was a fantastic uh, team right. that I put together. And I, I'm sure a lot of people, you know, did not like the Yankees that back then because they were winning all the time. So I'm sure there were a lot of people that grew to hate the team. You know, yeah. I mean, I know there were a lot of Red Sox fans yeah. too. 
So, you know, New England area. Yeah. So it had well, to be a crazy time. The people on my street were all Yankee fans. They loved the Yankees. Right. Yeah, they were all big Yankee fans, either Yankee or Dodger. Right. Okay. And I, I'm sure the Red Sox-Yankee rivalry really wasn't big yet because no. the Dodgers and Yankees played every year. Yeah. You know, and I mean, just crazy times. I mean, Jackie Robinson being able to do what he did, you know, Duke Schneider, all these guys – Pee Wee Reese, you know, yeah. I mean, it, it had to be so fun to watch baseball oh, all the time. Yeah, and it was tough to make the majors at that particular time because there's only eight teams in both leagues. Yeah. I mean, no, I don't know how many you have, but... Uh, no, it's crazy. I think yeah. it's, I want to say 32, but there I could you be go. off too. You know, so the odds of making it today are a lot greater than they were when I was a kid. Right. So now let me ask you this. Obviously, you know, your background is football, but... Did you have a sport that you loved more as a kid than the other? I mean, was it basketball? Was it baseball? Or was it always football? Mike, when I, when I was at Cross, I played um, football, basketball, and baseball. Right. I loved all three. I really did. Uh, I, I really enjoyed baseball. Uh, I was a catcher on the baseball team. Right. And uh, my coach, Ray Tellier, uh, was a scout for the minor leagues. And... Uh, when it came time for graduation, it was either, you know, I was gonna go to a college or I was gonna go give the minor leagues a shot in baseball. Right. Well, to make a long story short, uh, Ed Cavanaugh from Waterbury was the freshman coach at um, Kansas State. And uh, Cross was playing in a summer basketball league and my basketball coach, Red Vernerain, yeah, was coaching the team. And uh, Cavanaugh went up to Coach Werner and said, Coach, he says, you know, I'm so-and-so from Kansas State. Do you have anybody that I, I should be with? And Werner immediately gave him my name. Really? And, yeah, and uh, I think it was the next day, he, I get a phone call at the house, and it said, Cavanaugh, you want to come over and meet my parents and all this other stuff? So we did, and one thing led to another. The next thing I knew, about a month or so later, I had a plane ticket to Manhattan, Kansas. Wow. So I was going to go out there. And it was a blessing in disguise because I would never have been able to go to school and uh, get my education. Right. I had a four-year full scholarship, room, books, tuition, fees, $25 a month for laundry. Right. I ate at the training table all year round. <laughs> right. I, you know, it was something that was a, a blessing. Right. So let's talk about your high school career now. Um, so you said you didn't play till sophomore year. Was there no freshman for Wilbur Cross? No freshman. Cross? So no. they didn't have a freshman did team. Did not obviously. have a freshman team, no. Right. But did you have an idea that you wanted to play once you were a sophomore, that you were definitely going to go out for the team? Absolutely, yeah. Right. And Wilbur Cross was a pretty big football program back then, back if I'm then not mistaken, was, yeah. correct? Yeah. And now uh, who was the coach at the time? Ray Tellier. Right, Tellier. Yeah, yeah. Ray Tellier was the uh, – Football, uh, the baseball, and the hockey coach. Right. Yeah, Ray was a minor league baseball player, great, great uh, baseball man. Right. Knew the game inside and out, and he was a very good football man, too. He was a fundamentalist. I think when I went to Kansas State as a freshman, my fundamentals were probably better than 90% of the kids on the freshman team. And I right. attribute that to Ray. Right. Yeah. So now freshman year, you said you played three sports, obviously. So you were able to play basketball and baseball that year, correct? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, Wilbur Cross, I mean, you know, I, I'm not sure how they were back then, but they've always been a powerhouse basketball program. Um, was it big back then as well? Well, y yeah. Verderain was the reason for this, though. I mean, he, uh, he took, uh, when he took over at Wilbur Cross, uh, he really brought them to uh, a first-rate team. Right. Now, uh, Hill House at that time was the big basketball team. Right. And Hill House was so good, they were dubbed the Wonder Five. Right. Now, I was a, I was a uh, a junior when we were playing uh, Hill House. We used to play them in the Payne Whitney Gym. Right. I used to walk from my house on Main Street to the Payne Whitney Gym. Really. With my wow. with my pillowcase, I had my stuff in the pillowcase. That's what we <laughs> used to carry the stuff. Right. And uh, I never got in the game that particular night, but that was the night when Cross upset the best Hill House team that ever went on the court. And Red did it with the freeze. He held the ball. 
Right, the old and Princeton one. Yeah, yeah, he did it the first game, too, and they almost caused a riot in the Payne Whitney. In the second game, he got called in by the superintendent of schools. Right. He was told not to do that, and uh, he was told not to do it by the principal and what have you. He did it anyway, and he won the game. It was probably the biggest upset in, in high school athletics in, right. since the, in the history of the game. Right. It was an unbelievable thing. Right. The most, and the nice thing about it, two of my best friends, Johnny Criscola and Andy Esposito, who were the best, who were like brothers. Uh, right. The final, the final play of the game, now the place is going crazy. Right. When, when the game began, they saw uh, Johnny out there holding the ball and Nicky Esposito holding the ball. They started booing. I was sitting right next to Red. They were throwing things down from the stands oh, and everything. Geez. It was wow. uh, it was just, you know. <laughs> then as the game wore on, and we were hanging in there, uh, and and the freeze was working, you know, we're clearing out and aside for Johnny or Nikki to drive and boom, boom. we wound up um, in a situation where the um, there were I think four or five seconds on the clock. Red called timeout. He brought everybody over, and he called the play. He wanted to clear out a side for Johnny Griscola to drive in and take the shot. Right. So we set it up that way. And sure enough, here comes Johnny, takes the shot, misses, uh, and who's right behind him? But Andy, his mm, best friend. Right. I'm gonna start crying now because he catches the ball, boom, and he puts it in. Oh wow. And the buzzard went off as the ball was coming through the net. Wow. And it couldn't have been uh it couldn't I I couldn't, it couldn't have happened to two better people. Right. You know, they, you know and uh, they were both great competitors, and Johnny was a great basketball player. Andy was a journeyman. Right. But Johnny was very good, and uh, we won the game. Right. That's a great story, and I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure people stormed the court. Oh, I've never seen anything before or since like, like that particular night. Wow. It was an unbelievable, you, you couldn't, you couldn't get two people to bet on Wilbur Cross that night. Not right. two. But And they pulled off the you know, offset. They pulled up the offset. And that's pretty impressive. Oh. So talk to me about this, Coach. Um, you begin your sophomore year. Now you're with the football program. Let me ask you, how was it in the beginning? I mean, did you have to get used to the type of demands coach and staffs put on you? I mean, did you struggle at first just to find your way? How I was never it? did. I no. never did. I knew what it was all about. I knew what I was getting myself into. I, I knew the system because Jerry taught us the system when we were kids right. Around, on, right. around, on, on Main Street. He was a senior when I was a sophomore. So I knew the whole system. Uh, I wanted to be a fullback, so I, I knew my position right. and all that other stuff. And uh, I used to thrive in the heat. I love the heat. Right. Most kids don't like the heat. You know? right. So um, two days uh, during dog days of August and never bothered me. Never I was, bothered never you, no. bothered. And even when I went to Kansas, I took it better than the native Kansas. And it was hot in Kansas, very hot. Right. I loved it. I never, I, I used to love to, I was drenched though. Right. My, <laughs> my socks were drenched. You can hear them squishing when I was right. running or walking. But um, no, I, I, I loved every minute of it. I really did. To me, it wasn't, it, it wasn't a chore. I, you know, I, I enjoyed practice, if you want to. Right. You know. And now, how was the coaching staff? Were they demanding on you guys? I mean, at, at, at high school? Yeah. No, yeah, Ray, Ray was very good. Right. Ray was a very good fundamentalist. Um, I punted too, and he was an excellent punter. Right. He taught me how to punt. Uh, I say, when I went to college, my fundamentals as far as stance and starts and all that other stuff was already there. Better than anybody else there. Right. Uh, so he did a great job of teaching the fundamentals of the game. Right. Now, how did you do that year as a sophomore? Did you get in some varsity or did you play strictly JV? Or I played both? mostly JV. I did right. get in some varsity games, but not much. Right. Not much. My, my junior and senior year, I started both years. Right. And but the sophomore year, a lot of times, too, is the learning year. Yeah. So not everybody gets on the field. Let me ask you, though, you know, you brought up Hill House in the basketball game, which was huge. Was the football rivalry big yeah. as well? Talk yeah. about the Hill house Wilbur Cross rivalry a yeah. little bit. Well, we used to start with the uh, Harvest Day Parade where everybody made floats. 
Right. They come right down Whitney Avenue. I went, see, when I went to school, Cross Hill House and Borman Trade were on Towered Parkway, right across from the Payne Whitney Gym. Right. All three schools were right there. So the buses in the morning when they came in, they came in with the, uh, with the um, Hill House kids, the Cross kids, yeah. and the Borman Trade kids. Right. And it was a mess in the morning over there. There were a million kids all over the place. Right. So uh, I, I forgot the question. Oh, was the rivalry, how big was the rivalry? The rivalry like was very big. Yeah. We played in the Yale Bowl. When Cross played Hill House, we played in the Yale Bowl. We had 20, 25,000 people in the bowl. And this is Thanksgiving. This is thank yeah. No, this is the Harvest Festival game. Harvest Festival. Yeah, okay. not Thanksgiving. Right. West Haven and Hill House played on Thanksgiving. Back then. And they yeah. were the only ones that got a bigger crowd than we did. They got about 30, 35,000 when they played in the bowl. Right. And I'm going back, you know, several years. But, yeah, that's that was our Harvest Festival game. And uh, like I say... And would you play that in the middle of the year or towards the end? It was near the middle of the year. The middle, of, so probably yeah. like the sixth game, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. But the but the schools would put together floats, big parades. Right. Grammar school kids would be marching. Junior high school kids would be marching. Wow. High school kids. It was a big big deal. So that week had to be awesome oh. to be a kid and to yeah. be a part of it. I mean, yeah. you really had to enjoy it. Yeah. So, um, how did you do as a fullback? Were you able to carry the ball a lot? Or because I know back. Then a lot of times the fullback was more of the block end yeah. back, but were you able to carry the ball? Yeah, I got the ball the biggest percentage of the time. Right. You know, and uh, I had kids up front that did a nice job. So, and I, um, I, I had my, I, I had, you know, today they call it run to daylight. Right. Uh, I had my own knack for, <laughs> for doing that. My biggest problem was foot speed. Right. Okay. I was in the open so many times and got caught from behind, and it isn't even funny. I just didn't have, you know, that breakaway speed. Right. When I went to Kansas State, I, I started on the um, freshman football team at, at fullback. And then in the spring of my freshman year, because of my lack of foot speed, they moved me to guard. Really? Yeah, wow. because we were running the wing tee at that time. And the fullbacks and the guards, wasn't much difference between the two of them. Right. The they guards were pulling on every yeah. play. The fullback was leading on every play. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> when I went to Kansas State and I started to meet the kids that were there, like myself, the players, they were all fullbacks. Maybe 35 kids there were fullbacks. And what, at, what they did at that time, they used to recruit fullbacks right. and then convert them to tight ends, guards, whatever the situation might be. But they, they concentrated on getting fullbacks and they would... At, you know, according to their needs, they would slot them in. Right. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about um, junior and senior year. You were obviously in the backfield playing. Yep. Did you play defense at all? or maybe? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so you played both ways. And a yeah. lot of times back then, kids had to play both ways. Yeah. Um, would you play on defense? I played linebacker, linebacker. on defense. Okay, I was so, a fullback and a linebacker. Right. And uh, when I went to college, that's how they set it up too. The fullback and the center were linebackers. Really? Yeah. The wow. center and the fullback were linebackers, and then everybody else was, you know, wherever they played. But um, I, uh, I played. I, I, uh, my, one of my biggest thrills was scoring a touchdown in the Harvest Festival game, the oh, Hill House really? game. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I'll never forget that because it was a big, a great thrill. And uh, I ran right over Joe Luzzi, who was the captain of the team. He's right. dead now. Great kid. His right. brother Donato was an all-state player at uh, Wilbur Cross a few years prior to. Yeah. And then Joe went on to be a very good player at Villanova. Oh, wow. Okay. So uh, we, I, we were about two and a half yards out, and it was a fourth down play. Yeah. And Ray called a play where he gave me the ball over, over Joe. Yeah. And I remember hitting the line of scrimmage and having a little bit of a stalemate. Right. And I could feel Joe's legs moving. And I was moving my legs and I was on his back. And between the two of us, we were able to push it into the end zone. Oh, wow. But it was basically Joe Luzzi that was doing all the work. And did you win the game that day? No, we got beat. You got beat. Yeah, yeah. we got beat by a score. Right. Yeah. So. I never beat Hillhouse when I was there. Right. Hillhouse 
be to saw three years. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, um, the other thing too is, you know, you, you mentioned your dad, you had chores to do and stuff, but was he big into your football career? I mean, did you he- You know, my mother came to one game. They ripped the shirt off my back early in the game. She left, I think, at halftime and never came, and they never came to another to game. No. My father didn't know whether the ball was blown up with air or stuff with sawdust. You know, he, he worked all his life. Right. But so when I, I started to play, he got interested. Right. He came to the basketball games, he came to the football games, and he came to the baseball games. And he, he thoroughly enjoyed it. Right. Thoroughly enjoyed them. You know, it's funny, too, because a lot of times when you get into sports, it's usually, you know, your father who kind of influences you. But it's kind of interesting to see that he really didn't. No. <laughs> you kind of just, being a kid, got into sports. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. was he a sports fan at all or not? Really? Yeah, he was a sports fan. Um, he, uh, not not a real sports enthusiast, but he, he was a sports fan. Right. At that time, they used to have the, Gillette used to have the cavalcade of sports. It was a, a, a fighting card, a boxing card. Right. He used to watch that every Friday night, so he used to like to watch right, that. Right, right. Yeah, that's... Um, so let me ask you now, as, as a senior, I, I have to believe you were probably one of the captains, correct? I, I was a uh, tri-captain of the baseball team. Right. Joe Luzzi was captain of the football, the football team. Because back then they only did do one. one. Yeah. yeah. But let me ask you, let, since you mentioned baseball, you know, baseball has always been a great sport, one of the best. Um, did you, you loved football, but by the time you were in high school, I mean, did you have one that you preferred over the other? I mean... I bet whenever the season was, you enjoyed playing that sport at the time. I did, Mike, but you know, I wanted to be a football coach all my life. Oh, even in high yeah. school, huh? All my life, I wanted to be a football coach. Right. Um, and now, did you watch a lot of college football games oh, as yeah. a kid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my, my mother used to uh, go, you know, empty the basket from the, ba- from the bathroom and what have you, and she would say to my father, what is it? When I would go to the bathroom, I diagram plays. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> and she would look at that, and she didn't know what, what the heck it was. And she showed it to my father. My father didn't know what it was either until finally, you know, I told him, those are, those are football plays, Mom. Right. And uh, I was only a kid at the time, but I... Uh, now, were there any coaches that you kind of idolized that made you want to be a coach? Or? I, I idolized my high school coaches. Right. Uh, Ray Tellier and, and Red Verderain. Right. Uh, Ray Tellier because he was the football coach. Red Verderain because he had a unique knack of being able to motivate every kid on his team to play to their optimum ability. Right. I've always admired him for that, and I've always tried to emulate that. I always felt as though one of the biggest jobs of a coach is not necessarily X and O's, but it's touching the heart of each kid on that team, finding, f- finding the button that has to be pushed to get that kid to do his maximum, make a maximum effort on every play. Right. One of the proudest things, uh, one of the things that I'm most proudest of is that when I left Kansas State, when I graduated from Kansas State, uh, my head coach was, got fired. We beat Nebraska, by the way, in my junior year. Right. And that was his last game, and he got fired. And I love the guy. His name was Bus Murdies. He went on to coach the um, uh, the Vikings for years. Right. And uh, I said to him, you know, I'm, I, I want to get into the coaching field, and I'd like to know if you give me a letter of recommendation. And he did. Right. And in that letter, he said that Ronnie Carbone is the hardest working player on the Kansas State football team. Wow. And of all the things that you know, have been said and what have you, that meant more to me than any of the other ones. Right. And he was right. <laughs> <laughs> I was the hardest working player on the Kansas State football team. Right. But he put it in writing. And uh, Did you save it? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah, I did. I, ha- yeah. I still have it at home. The paper is turned all different colors and what have right. you, but I still have that letter. Yeah, those are things that's, you don't ever want to No, that's out. the only thing that I, I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm not a collector, you know, I don't. Right. But that I kept. Right. That I kept. That that meant more to me than anything that I've had a lot of awards and high school the trophies. I was athlete of the year in my senior year and all that other stuff, which was a big, big deal. Nothing comes close to that statement by uh, by Bus Murdies. That's pretty yeah. amazing. 
So let me ask you, when you put the pads on for the final time as a high school player, was there sadness or did you just look at it as this is, you know, I'm just going to the next chapter in my career? One of the saddest days in my life was when I finished high school at Wilbur Cross when I played my last baseball game. Right. We, had, we used to have our lockers up in the penthouse, way up on the top of the school. Right. They were wire lockers, you know. And I used to shave there in the morning before school, shower, and all that. I mean, that was my... <laughs> that was your life, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. was my whole life. And uh, leaving high school was the t one of the toughest things I've ever had to do. Mm. I really loved school. I and loved high school. It's carefree times, too, oh. you know. Like, I mean, it's the time where you could really, like, yeah. you know, because you don't really enjoy school and grammar school. Yeah. But when you get to high school... Oh. You know, you meet different people, yeah. and it, you know, plus you're playing all the sports. It's yeah. really a carefree time for yeah. a, a young individual's life. And all my all my schoolmates were beautiful people. I got along with everybody very, very well. Yeah, I I I was deeply saddened when I realized that I was all done with with high school. Right. So now, coach, by talking to you, you don't seem like the type of guy that gets too nervous about things. But when you you know left, you know, to say goodbye to your parents to go to Kansas State. Were you nervous at all or were you just anxious to, for the next challenge? Mike, let me tell you something. When I left for Kansas State, it was the first day in my life I was in a cab, on a train, yeah. on a plane, outside the state of Connecticut, and slept in a bed other than my own. Really? I used to sleep in a bed with my two brothers. We, we, we all slept, three of us, in one bed. Right. I never went anywhere. When I came to be interviewed for the Derby job, I didn't know where Derby was. My brother Tony put me in the car and drove me down, yeah. waited for me, and took me home. I, I, I never left Fairhaven. Right. We never went anywhere. So My grandkids uh, just came back from Italy. They, uh, they, they went oh, to wow. me. I mean. <laughs> well, you kind of grew up, too, in the recession. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, it was different yeah. times. It was I mean. very different. I mean. Going to Savin Rock on graduate on, on, on promotion day was a big thing. We looked forward to that. When you got promoted from one grade to the other, the reward was to go to Savin Rock. And uh, you know, your parents would give you a few bucks, whatever it was. I remember when uh, when my mother used to go looking for a change when we wanted to go to the theater on a Saturday. We wanted to go to the theater on Grand Avenue. And uh, she would go and she had uh, a jar of coins. At that time, it was 25 cents to get in. Right. She had five quarters, we went. She had four quarters, we didn't go. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Until we had that fifth quarter. Right. Then we all went to the, to the theater. So uh, I, I have such beautiful memories of growing up in Fairhaven. It's unbelievable. Right. I, I thank God frequently for the opportunity of being born at that particular era in that area right the people were super people we never locked our doors at night right. our doors were wide open i never had a key to my house so never had a, a safe key. area i would have lost it anyway but i never <laughs> had a key you know my aunt lived uh, my aunt and my grandmother lived on the second and third floor and we lived on the first floor and uh, nobody in the neighborhood locked their doors right it was wide open Wow, that's crazy. You can't even imagine that no. today. <laughs> so let me ask you, you start off at Kansas State. You played on the freshman team, yeah, correct? Yeah. And you talked about the wing tee. Let me ask you, that that would become a an offense that a lot of high schools would use, especially in the late 80s, early 90s. Talk about the wing tee. Did you like it? I mean, I know you got moved to guard, but did you like that offense? I wrote a book about it. Really? I have, I have a book published on the wing tee, Innovations wow. in the Wing Tee. I love the wing tee. Right. You know, because... Um, and it's a great offense. It's it a really great is. offense, yeah. And uh, I, I read about a lot of the coaches that had, you know, worked with the, with the wing tee at that time. It was Forrest Evasheski at Iowa and uh, Toby Raymond at uh, Delaware and uh, the guy at um, uh, Dr. Doc... Um, he was an actual doctor, a medical doctor. He was at... Um, Catholic school, Purple, Holy Cross. Holy Cross, okay. Yeah, it was at yeah. Holy Cross. Doc Anderson, that's who it was. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was fascinated with the wing T. I had a guy, a coach by the name of Nutsy Norton. Okay. Who coached the line at Kansas State. He was the third best line pole coach in the country. Was in Dell Magazine. I read it myself. Right. And uh, he was a stickler for fundamentals. I mean, a stickler. They didn't call him Nutsy for nothing either. He was. Right. He was <laughs> but I loved the guy. I right. loved the guy. I, everybody on the team hated him. Didn't want any part of him. But he would make you do, when he told you that he wants a six inch step, I mean, he'll take a, a, a rule around and make sure that you took a six inch step. Everything had to be perfect. Right. And my, my technique probably was better than anybody else on the team, any of the other linemen on the team. I had great technique, and he's the reason for it. Right. Of course, you know, I wanted to be a coach. Right. I listened to every word he said. I did everything he told me to do, and I did it exactly how he wanted to wanted it done. That's how I got by. Right. Mike, I was about 185, 190 pounds when I was playing in the Big Eight. It was the Big Eight at that time. Yeah. We're playing Oklahoma. And you're we're playing play Division One. And yeah, yeah. We're playing. We're, we're and playing. alignment. Yeah. You know, which is unusual. But what I had going for me was that I was in the wing T system, and I pulled on every play. Very seldom that I have to go straight ahead. Right. And when I did, I would hit my reference points and get underneath the people that I, I was blocking, you know? Right. So, uh, but when I was pulling I, and, and trapping or pulling and leading up a hole or something like that, my technique was impeccably good. Right. And that's what got me by. I had great technique. I used to trap that two-man sled on the practice field for hours right. after practice. I mean, you know, dip and lift, bend and explode up and all this other business. I, I worked on that and I had it down to a, to a science. Right. And that's how I got by. Wow. I had, to be, I had to be great with my technique because I wasn't physically that big. Right. Now, how would you um, evaluate your college career? Did, were you satisfied with it? Did you think it was successful? And you did start, correct? This I time did. I, I started as a freshman. I started on the freshman team. And I started uh, in my junior and senior year at guard. At freshman, right. I was the uh, fullback. And in my junior and senior year, I was the left guard. Right. And uh, I, I started both both years. Right. And, and the teams were good? Or? Well, we were not a great team. At right. that particular time, this guy, Bill Schneider, who's at Kansas State now, he's, he's done a m marvelous job. Right. He's a magician. And he's a great guy. He's a, a, he's a great guy. You know what he did? He sent, uh, I, I belong to the Wildcat Club. You know, I give him 100 bucks a year, you know, and all this other stuff. Right. He sent all the former players a letter, and he wanted us to write uh, something to the kids on his team, a, motiv a motivation type of thing. Right. And he said, you can do it to any one player. You can do it to any group of people and all this other business, you know. So uh, I chose to do it to the team, and I wrote a little something about intrinsic values that I always believed in all my life. Right. He wrote me back. Now, you know how busy those guys are? Yeah. He took the time to write me back and thank me for that note. And he did it on, with purple ink, <laughs> a purple card. I mean, he took such pains to do that. I understand why the guy's a winner. Right. You know what I mean? He, does, he doesn't leave anything, you know, to chance. Right. Every, he dots every I and he crosses every T. But I never, never, ever got something like that from a college coach before in my life. And I've been doing it a long time. Right. I got it from him. Wow, that's a great story. Yeah. That really is. Yeah. So, Paul Pasqualoni and George, the Paul, you know, Paul's with, uh, he's with uh, Boston College now. Yeah, yeah. And George is with, um, uh, out in Texas there. Who was it? The, the, the kid uh, just from Temple, Yule went out there. Right. What's the name of that school? Ah, uh, jeez. Yeah, it's escaping me right now. Yeah, so. but anyway, the, they, they both played, uh, I mean, they, they both coached professional football as well as high school football. Right. Paul Pasqualoni told me that when he, when he has a, a problem uh, coaching-wise, whether it's psychology or what, whatever it might be, he calls Bill Snyder. Wow. George De Leon, the same way. They called Bill Snyder and asked Bill Snyder's advice about this, that, or the other thing. I could see why. Right. Yeah, it sounds like he's got it all together, oh. which is tremendous. Yeah. 
So now, Coach, let me ask you, you finished college. Number one, did you want to be a teacher as well? Like, was that always the goal, or did you figure to be a football coach you needed to be a teacher? That's what it was. Yeah, so you really weren't too interested in teaching. You just no. knew that. So let me ask you, you get out of college. Did you coach anywhere before the Derby job came open? I went with my high school coach, Ray Tellier, I coached one year. At Wilbur Cross? At, no, at oh. Notre Dame High School. He was Notre in Notre Dame, Dame at the oh, time. Oh, okay. All right. And that's Notre Dame of West Haven? Yes, Notre right. Dame of West Haven. And we had a kid on the team by the name of Bartolucci. Right. I think his father's from Derby. Yes, yeah. He used to come down and watch practice all the time and what have you. The kids at Notre Dame spoke very well of me and they liked me and I always got along with kids anyway. And right. So. And you were, that year you coached at Notre Dame, I believe you were what, maybe 21 at the most, 22? I was 22. Right. That's when I took the job at, uh, at the Derby, I, I, I just turned 23. Right. I was a few years older than the seniors right. on the team. So well, let's talk about the Derby job because obviously that's, you know, a big part of your life as well. Were there any jobs that you had inquired about before Derby or basically did the Derby job come open and what made you decide to apply for it? I wanted to be a head coach. Always yeah. wanted to be a head coach. I put in one year with Ray and uh, he let me put in the he let me put in the Oklahoma defense, the five two defense. Yeah. Which was my uh, I knew every every position, technique and all this other business. I put that defense in that particular year. And uh, the Derby job opened and the Bartolucci fella. He told me right. that the job was going to be open. He says, why don't you apply for it? I put them, so I did. And uh, I think I got the job because nobody else wanted the job. Right. That, that may be part of it. But at, at any rate, um, uh, I went home from the interview and I was in bed and the phone rang and it was the Board of Education same night that I had the interview, right. they told me I got the job. Oh, wow. And all this other business. My heart was beating a mile a minute. I don't think I slept a, uh, an hour that night. And I, I so got to believe you didn't think you'd be a head coach that fast. No. Right. No. But uh, you know what? I was, I was ready. Right. I was, I was ready. I was now, so sure let me ask of myself. You, did, did teaching come along with it? I mean, or you did know you know what happened? To... You know what happened? I had a biological science minor. I minored in biological sciences, which I liked. And uh, the only job that they could give me was teaching biology. Right. Five, five classes a day. And you know, back then, Coach, if I'm not mistaken, the, the freshmen had to go to school in the afternoon because the school wasn't big enough for all four grades. So there were the sophomore juniors and seniors went to school from like, uh, let's say, seven to 12. And then the freshmen had to go 12 to 5. So, I mean, did that affect you at all? Like, did you have to teach in the afternoon, or how did it work? No, I taught, uh, I, I taught in the morning and the afternoon, the whole, the whole schmear. Right. And um, it was physically very demanding because I was concentrating so much on football. I just spent so much time on football. Right. Then I had to, ha had to prepare lessons in biology. Right. And I never felt good about that because... I always felt as though I was shortchanging the kids a little bit. I never put into my teaching job what I put in my coaching job, and that bothered me. Right. It bothered me for a couple of reasons. Number one, I loved the kids in Derby. Right. I loved all of them, the kids who played, the kids who didn't play. Right. I loved the administrators, Cromick and Angie and yes. the whole yeah. bit. You know, I loved. I loved. It reminded me so much of Fairhaven. That it was almost like I never left, right? You know, coming into Derby, and I wanted I, I wanted what was best for those kids, and I never felt as though I was best for those kids in the biology room, and that played on me and weighed on me very heavily for right. all five years. I tried several times to get into the physical education department, but there were no spots. Yeah, no spots. And I was hoping that they would take the guy who was teaching phys ed for the system and just make him the elementary. Phys ed guy put me in the high school right. and let me be the high school physical phys education. It never, it never came to be to fruition, but it was killing me. It was killing me physically because I had to work so hard at it. 
and mentally because I felt guilty right. <coughs> about not giving these kids in the biology class what I should be giving them. Right. So that, that really tore at me, and uh, it was a very difficult thing to handle. Right. Now let me ask you, Coach, um, I, did, were there spring practice back then? I mean, when did you get the job? Did you get it before spring practice? Yeah. Or? Right. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, there was spring practice. Uh, I, I took the team for the springtime, and then uh, you know, we went right into the fall. Right. So let me ask you, how, back then, Coach, did the Board of Ed just hire assistant coaches, or did you get to have some say in who you were going to pick for your coaches? How did you go about Because you put together a pretty good staff, Billy McAllister, um, Scooble, obviously, and then um, what's his name, Kryeski? Yeah, and right. Springer. Right, Springer. And Spr right. Yeah. so talk about how you were able to assemble your coaching well, staff. Well, they were there. They were there. I was just very fortunate. I was fortunate to be able to get Billy McAllister on the staff. Right. I was fortunate that John Scooble was on the staff who I loved like a brother. Right. Tremendous guy. Can't, he, of course, he passed on now, but right. can't say enough good things about him and his wife, Dolores. And, uh, Spr uh, Springer was a very nice fella. He was there. Right. And Kryatsky was... The uh, freshman coach? I he believe. was the freshman coach, right. yeah. So I had a very nice... Uh, and they were loyal people. Right. They were good to me. And now did you meet up with them and interview them and kind of talk? Or you just, they were there song and That's it, yeah. Now, Billy Mack wasn't, correct? No. He was the one that you took? Yeah. Right. And, you know, he had come from Ansonia. Yeah. So I think that was a good thing for you, too, because he kind of knew Valley football. Yeah, he did. And what it was. So he I think did. that was important. And he was young, just like you. I yeah. think he was 23 at the time, yeah. too. So um, talk to me about this, though, Coach. A guy that, like, basically spent his whole life you know, in the Fairhaven area, you love Wilbur Cross. So you don't, you never heard of Derby, correct? Before you got this job, or briefly? I didn't know how to get to Derby. Right. I heard of Derby, you know, uh, Aunt Sonia, but uh, I had no idea where it was. Right. You know, and as you know, even today, I'm not good with directions. Right. Well, you know. I'm the same, so don't feel yeah. bad. But let me ask you. I mean, did you? I mean. Did you like talk to people about you know what it's like in Derby to kind of get a feel, or did you just kind of you know figure it out as you went along? Billy and his wife told me a great deal about um, Billy McAllister and his wife. Uh, yeah, you know, told me a, uh, a great deal about the valley and the rivalry and all of this other stuff. And uh, the Cernetskys. I had a kid, John Cernetsky. Right. Yeah, his mother and father. Uh, I was very friendly with them, and they told me a lot about the valley, and you know, and they, you know, all, all they said was, "You got to beat Ansonia. You got to beat Ansonia." Right. And you know, to me, and you I, really didn't know that rivalry. No, right? I didn't know that rivalry, and I, I didn't buy into it because, to me, uh, I wanted every game the same way, desperately. Right. I don't care if it was Ansonia or the, the, to me, they you were. You didn't look to just one game. No. That wasn't oh, how you no. coached, right? <laughs> no. No, I wanted to win every game that right. we played, and I could never understand, uh, you know, how, how you, you shoot for particular games because don't you have to, I mean, aren't you obliged to make an honest effort? This is what I used to try to get out of the kids, and I used to talk to the kids all the time about things like this. You know, if you want to be honest, if you want to be able to look at yourself in the morning in the mirror, without any reserves, without any regrets, you have a moral obligation yeah. to do the best you can. Every single solitary play, I should tell them all the time, most of the teams that you're going to be playing against are not going to be going all out on every play. Now, whatever we lack size-wise and numbers-wise and what have you, we can make up by out-hustling the other team. Right. You know, by making it a point of personal pride, each and every one of us, to make our maximum effort on every play. And I kept on e emphasizing to them the importance of that. Right. And little by little by little, I could see them buying into the, that right. particular thing. See, I, I think, uh, once again, I go back to Red Vertery. What he got out of me, a <laughs> basketball floor, I never yeah. knew I was capable of. Right. You know, but it was using motivation saying the right things at the right time. And all I did was I told them what was in my heart. I mean, I didn't make anything up. I didn't go home and read a book about it. I told them what I felt in my heart. This is what I feel about men. Right. Here's what I think we have to do to, to be 
successful. If you want to have a, a, a happy experience with football, nothing comes easy in this world. Everything you get, you get by the sweat of your brow. Right. Okay, you got to work for it. And if you don't work for it, it isn't meaningful. Right. So, Coach, let me ask you, and, you know, we're definitely going to spend a lot of time in part two about Derby, but how tough was it in the beginning, you know, the first couple weeks of practice? Because these kids really weren't used to the type of style that you no. presented to them. Yeah. So tell me how tough it was in the beginning. It was very difficult. It was very difficult. And you took some criticism from parents, too, oh, in the beginning, yeah, correct? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I know there was yeah. kids who had quit the team. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, just talk about that a little bit. Well... I think there was nine seniors that left the team, and uh, and I believe a couple were captains. You yeah. Know? So I yeah. mean, you know, that's uh, you're losing captains. So right off the bat, it wasn't an easy uh, time for you. Well, the reason that we lost them is because we expected so much more out of them than they were willing to give. Right. And I would tell them constantly, if you make the, the decision to play football then you have to understand that you're going to have to be able to measure up to the expectations of uh, someone who wants to be a football player. And I said, you know, you're playing for a, a school here that has a tr very thick tradition. Uh, you know, there's a, they're very proud people here in Derby. Right. They're proud of everything that they do. And uh, you have to earn that pride. You just don't get that. Right. You've you got to earn that pride by, by working and working hard. And it was a difficult time. It was difficult selling that concept to them. Right. But those who, we used to play, I think I wound up with 22 kids my first year. Yeah. After most, a lot of people left. Those 22 kids, they were all underclassmen, by the way. Those 22 kids would play a varsity game on a Saturday and a JV game on a Monday. They played twice a week. Right. <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, I, I, I can't begin to tell you the respect I have for that first group that I had because it was a shock to them. Right. And they took it. And they took it. Right. They took it and they responded beautifully. They responded like champions. I'll, I'll never forget those kids. I mean, I have such warmth for them. Right. Uh, that it, they were just great. Well, you they, know, Coach. We're going to discuss those kids in part two. It's been a lot of fun in part one, and I really want to thank you for coming on. And we're just getting started because in part two, you're going to hear all about the Ron Carbone era in Derby as well as in Hamden and Hamden Hall. For Hometown Heroes, I'm Mike Canici saying good night, everyone.